Hey everyone, hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I'm so excited because I'm going to be talking about the New York Times Best Books of 2022. Now, if you are new to my channel, then hi, welcome, I'm Shelly. I love books and reading, I love it so much. And I'm also on a no buy. This means that I, I pledged not to buy anything in November and so far I've kept my pledge, I've kept my promise to myself and it is very tempting as these end of the year lists crop up. Now today is the last day in November and so technically tomorrow I could buy these books but I'm definitely in a no buy mode, meaning I don't wanna just go out on December 1st and buy a bunch of books. I wanna be a little more discerning. I wanna be a little more grounded with my choices. I guess a better way of saying that is as I'm looking excitedly and curiously and getting my sort of gumption up for these books, like getting my excitement up for these books, I'm also looking at it with a critical lens and thinking about what books on my shelves that are stoking that same kind of desire in me that these books are possibly tickling that I can pick up off my own shelves. I'm also just looking like looking at the market, looking at these best of lists and admiring their choices and thinking about their choices and ruminating about the choices and you know getting myself excited for the coming year and also just keep, keeping my head about this because I am one of those people that get excited that does get excited about a list and then wants to go out and buy the whole list or put everything on hold. Yeah. So, anyways, um, I am so excited to dive into this with you, and let's just let's just get started. I have scooted over a touch so I can have plenty of room for pictures. The first book on this list is Jennifer Egan's *The Candy House*, and this book is really making a splash this year. It is set in the same universe as uh, A Visit from the Goon Squad, which was also written by Jennifer Egan. That book, A Visit from the Goon Squad, won the Pulitzer Prize for that year. It was huge for that year. And now The Candy House is cropping up on all of these end of the year lists. And believe me, believe you me, <laughs> it is tempting me. It is tempting me, it is tempting my soul. I want to pick it up, but I don't wanna start with her newest book. Um, if I was going to start with Jennifer Egan, I've never read anything by this author. I've heard really good things about A Visit from the Goon Squad. I've hit, I've heard mixed reviews about The Candy House, to be quite honest. Um, but I want to start with the, the book that made the bigger splash, to be, to be totally honest with you. I want to start with the backlist book, the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, the one that has been vetted and loved by many. And so it's an easy no for me. It's an easy pass for me, even though I am really excited to see Jennifer Egan pop up again. And it is nudging me towards wanting to buy a visit from the Goon Squad, but it is an easy no for me to say no thanks to the Candy House because I would like to start with you know, the first book in this universe. If you want a couple of keywords about The Candy House, which I should probably put in, uh, it is, um, has, it, ta it is talking about modernity, it is set in a dystopia, <laughs> and it has some sci-fi elements to it. Next we have Checkout 19 by Claire Louise Bennett. Can we just take a moment, a moment of appreciation for this gorgeous cover? <sighs> I'm just a sucker for good covers and this is one of them. Now this is a, this is pulling at polar opposites of my heartstrings. So I have my computer here and I have notes. On the one hand, there is, it says that it is ostensibly about a woman falling in love with language. Yes, please. <laughs> I love books that have like lang plays on language, commentary about language. Um, when you really get the feeling, the immense feeling that the author is in love with language. And so a story about a woman falling in love with, in, with language is like, oh yes, yes please, stop tempting me. And then my other buzzwords is that there is an unusual setting. It is about the human mind, a brilliant, surprising, weird, and very funny one. I was like, I want a brilliant, surprising, weird, and very funny book. Now here's the, here's my, the words that are making me halt, okay? Here's, here's the words that are kind of turning me off to this read. An experimental autofiction surrealist book. 
I don't know. I don't know. So I'm going to err on the side of caution and I'm going to wait for some booktube reviews. I'm going to just like sit back and see how everyone receives this. If, if anyone does, you know, I don't know if anyone will read this. Maybe I'll wait for Steve Donahue's review. I don't know. But like, I'm just like, on the one hand, I'm like, yes, I want, I want one side of this book. But I don't know if I want it in the way that it's been, it's being served. It's kind of like, yes, I want a latte, but I don't know if I want the experimental jalapeno mint in it. I just want regular vanilla latte. I just want a good old vanilla latte. No experiments here. All right. Another book that is having quite a big year is Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. Now this is again popping up on all of the end of the year lists and I'm so excited for Barbara Kingsolver. She has just been around and then some. She's got a huge back catalog and the fans of hers are fans with their full hearts. You know, <laughs> like people who love her work love her work. I read The Poisonwood Bible, which is like arguably her most famous work, uh, her most popular work, and I enjoyed it. There was a large chunk of it that I enjoyed. And then about the last 20% of the book, it kind of, it kind of lost itself. It got away from what it was trying to do, in my opinion, and it sort of went off in all directions. And though it was a great introduction to King Solver's work, it didn't leave me with a feeling of wanting more. Now, this is going to be very Barbara King Solvery from what I know about her. It's going to be about childhood poverty, opioid addiction, rural dispossession. I mean, that seems to me like very Barbara King Solver from what I've read about her and from what I've read of her. And it's going to be a play, a play on David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. You know, on the one hand, I'm like, it sounds good, but it's also this massive chunkster. It's huge, and it's a bit of an easy no for me. Um, I know a lot of booktubers have already bought this, and I will be excited to see their reviews and then kind of get to what the the public says about it before I even before I even toe the line of wanting to read it. We're getting another new to me book and it's called The Furrows by Namwali Serpel. Now this is, oh gosh, the quote the Times picked for this book is really kind of getting me. This is the quote. I don't want to tell you what happened, the narrator says. I want to tell you how it felt. Oh, oh, I can't, mm, that is so good. So it's about uh, a man who has lived through childhood trauma and is working through that and now is in an intimate relationship but is haunted by his past. <sighs> a lot of a lot of key words there. I feel like I could easily come up with a book in my own collection ab about this. Actually, a book has just come to mind. Let me grab it. This is Call Me By Your Name by Andre Osman. I have been meaning to read this for a hot minute and it I don't know if it's necessarily about trauma but I know I've read the first the beginning of this and it was gorgeous don't ask me why I haven't picked it up again but it's a, a love story and it's about someone thinking back on his childhood and this um, intense love that he had as a as a young man and make the, I think the impact and the implications that that has made on him throughout his life. I'm getting the same vibes, you know? I'm getting the same vibes as The Furrows is giving, at least from this description and from my, what I know of Asimin's work. And so I'm just going to, you know, stick with what I own, although The Furrows does sound really good. Another book, having another big year, and that's Trust by Hernan Diaz. This was long listed, was it also? No, it was just long listed for the booker and everybody and their mother read it, not me. I wasn't really that interested in it. And it got a mixed review. It got a really mixed review. I feel like some people really, really, really loved it. And then the other people said that they could appreciate what was happening, but didn't quite love it. And you know, I can I, you know, Frazier was one of those people in the latter group and I was like, I just, I just, tr I trust his opinion. I don't, I don't really want to read trust because I trust Frasier. No, that's it. So we've gone through all the fiction books. We're going to end with the five nonfiction books. And the first one is An Immense World by Ed Young. Now the, the line that the Times wrote at the very end about this is really compelling. Here's what the Times wrote. Young is a terrific storyteller and there are plenty of surprising animal facts 
to keep this, mo this book moving toward its profound conclusion. The breadth of this immense world should make us recognize how small we really are. I love books that remind me of my context in this world. I just, I, I love that. I love books about bugs and animals and understanding them better, but also it helps me remember that I am on this planet with so many other living things. And that feeds my gratitude, that feeds my spirit, that helps me remember who, who I am, you know? And I really love books that do that. And so on the surface, this book does seem like it would be for me. However, I, I'm wondering where this book will end up. In, in regards to this, I'm planning to judge the booktube prize for next year, and I'm wondering if it will land on the booktube prize list. I'm wondering if this will pop up in other prize lists, and it will, and I will remember this moment <laughs> when the times, you know, when the times made me interested in the read and it will just kind of fuel a, a desire to read it later on. But for right now, this is one of the first times I've heard about it. I've maybe heard some buzz around the community with this book, but not enough for me to be like, oh yeah, I really wanna read that. Even though, gosh, the times you, you write really good copy. <laughs> Here's another book that is really kind of tickling my fancy. And I'm so glad it's on the Times' list because it makes me aware of really interesting books. And, oh gosh, okay, so I'm going to read you some of the, the buzzwords from it. So it's Stay True, a memoir by Hua Hsu. And it's a quietly wrenching memoir where Hsu recalls starting out in Berkeley. I'm a California girl at heart. I visited Berkeley quite often when I was a child or and in my teenage years and even in my early 20s. I really love Berkeley. I wanted to move there at one point, so that's kind of getting me. It's set in the mid-1990s, so I'm like, oh another, that's a really cool time period. And uh, Hsu is a watchful music snob, fastidi fastidiously curating his tastes and mercilessly judging the tastes of others. I love a good music snob. My husband is one of them. <laughs> I just, oh, I just love it. And then he meets Ken, a Japanese American frat boy, and their friendship is intense, but brief because of a death. So, um, and then it's about working through that trauma and that death. And the, the death is, is in a very traumatic way. Um, also, I want to, my, my whole family, my grandmother uh, was Japanese. And so my whole family is Japanese American. She came from Japan. She had married uh, an American, uh, someone who has a long lineage in the States. And so my father grew up with um, a mother who was Japanese, or is Japanese, was Japanese, she's now passed, and a father who was deeply American. And so we have kind of, we have that bo both sides in, in our family. And so whenever something is Japanese American, it really does kind of tickle my tickle my fancy <laughs> like it perks me up a little bit I'm like what 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 is it about um and so yeah so on on the surface this book is for me I was like did you write it just for my soul just for me to love and enjoy but I am gonna wait on this uh the nonfiction is a, a kind of easy to wait on because again I'm gonna be judging the book two prize and so I'm wondering what how these will shake out if these will get picked for the book two prize if I might be assigned them for the book two prize so we will see, but stay true. Oh, sounds good. Sounds good, y'all. The Times really knows how to pick them because the next book too, it sounds good. It's called Strangers to Ourselves, Unsettled Minds and the Stories That Make Us by Rachel Aviv. And what she does is that she writes stories about people who have extreme mental duress. And she is starts with her own story, which is um, a story in which she experienced and suffered from anorexia starting at the age of six. It says that it's not an anti-psychiatry book, but, oh gosh, again, the copy. It says what she does, what Aviv does, is hold space for empathy and uncertainty, exploring the multiplicity of stories instead of jumping to the impulse to explain them away. I think The Times is really good at writing copy for a millennial heart, because, oh gosh, isn't that just, that's just great. So, oh, I might, <laughs> my no buy ends tomorrow, and this is the one that I'm like, Am I gonna make it? <laughs> no, I'll make it. I'm just like, how quickly am I gonna buy this book? I don't, 
I don't know, but it does sound really good, right? I should, I should check with my library first. Another great sounding book and it's called Under the Skin, The Hidden Toll of Racism on American Lives and on the Health of Our Nation. And it's by Linda Velisaroa. Now this is going to be talking about black Americans and the way the intersection or that's not the right word the uh the way the overlapping of black american lives and the american healthcare system and she's exploring that and the dis discrepancy and the higher mortality rates that black americans have and why that is and she's going to be diving deep into that subject now here's the deal i am the last person on earth to read cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And so when I think about black Americans and explain, explaining black American life, I feel like I wanna read that foundational book first before I read Under the Skin. Though it sounds really interesting, I'm more interested when it comes to um, talking, theor theorizing, um, diving into the subject of black American life, I want to read Wilkerson first because I, I is that her name? Well, well, I think that is. Anyways, I want to read Cast first because it is what's really kind of getting me in this moment. So yeah, but oh, it sounds so good. This last book is where we see something quite new. At least I haven't quite heard of it, heard of this kind of narrative being told. And the book is We Don't Know Ourselves by Fatan O'Toole. And it's a personal history of modern Ireland. And so what O'Toole does is that he takes the last six decades of Ireland and the history of Ireland and compares them and contrasts them with his own life. And so it's a bit memoir, it's a bit history, it's a bit critical and explorative about the modern history of Ireland. And I think it's doing something quite different. Now that does, that does sound really interesting. <laughs> And that, like, I'm like, I'm looking at all these nonfiction books and I'm like, can we just choose all of them for the booktube prize, y'all, so that we can read them together and see how good they are? Um, why am I p putting it on the booktube prize? I feel like because if I'm assigned it, I will definitely read it. But otherwise, if I buy it, it might languish on my shelves, which is probably the true answer to all of these nonfiction books is that I have a, I have a bunch of nonfiction books that are sitting there. I'm not reading them. And so as much as I want to buy more nonfiction, it's the thing that I feel like I'm a bit rusty at, at this moment, even with Nonfiction November, it's the thing that I am a, avoiding a tiny bit. And so though nonfiction is really piquing my interest and it's like making me like think, oh yeah, that sounds really good. There is the reality that I have about two dozen nonfiction books that are languishing and looking at me and wanting to be read. So yeah, so O'Toole, you sound amazing, but I'm gonna have to wait on you because I have other books calling my name. But yeah, that's it. That is the New York Times best books of, 10 best books of 2022. Uh, fascinating list, a lot of books I've never heard of, a handful of books that I have, and just a, just a fantastic list to dive into. What did you like from this list? What are you gonna read from it? What have you read from it? What are you not going to read from it? Because that's just as important as what you are going to read from it. And yeah, you know you've been quite chatty when your camera has died twice during this filming process. So I'm going to go. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here and exploring this list with me. I, I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you all in my next one. Bye, guys.